I have a suspicion that throughout, or a theory at least, that throughout church history, it has been common for those who didn't like someone else to label them as the Antichrist. For instance, in the time of the time of the reformers, people like Martin Luther and other reformers labelled the Pope as the Antichrist, and it's been common through till this this present age. In the 1920s or 1930s, Mussolini would have been labelled as the an Antichrist or the Antichrist, and then a worse person came along. Hitler, and certainly he was an Antichrist for obvious reasons, but not the Antichrist with a capital A, who will appear at the end of the age. And in more recent times, contemporary figures too have been labelled as Antichrist or as the Antichrist, and it only gets more and more ridiculous as we go. Well, today we will look at the Antichrist in a sound, sane, biblical way so that it makes sense and is clear. Now, the Antichrist will have a number of names just as the real Son of God has a multiplicity or number of names. We know that Jesus, the coming true Messiah, was given names in the prophet Isaiah. For instance, Isaiah 9.6 says that he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Elsewhere, he is called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. The Antichrist, or anti-Messiah, because Christ means Messiah, will be a counterfeit of the real Messiah. A counterfeit banknote causes confusion in the monetary system and confuses and deceives many. In the same way, the Antichrist will cause confusion and will deceive many. Let's look at some of the names ascribed to the Antichrist in the Bible. Genesis 3.15 he will be called the seed or offspring of Satan. Daniel 8.23, stern-faced king. Daniel 9.26, the ruler who will come. Daniel 11.36, the willful king. 2 Thessalonians 2.3, part of our reading. The man of lawlessness or the man of sin. 2 Thessalonians 2.8, the lawless one. 1 John 2.22, the most common title, the Antichrist. And in Revelation 11.7, the beast, the beast from the sea, from which we get the term, the mark of the beast, which we'll look at next week. Let's look at the origins of the Antichrist. His natural origin is given in Daniel 9.26, where we read, The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city, meaning Jerusalem in this context, and the sanctuary, meaning in this context, the temple. And we need to note carefully what the prophet Daniel is saying here. What people group destroyed the holy city and the holy temple in AD 70? Well, it was a people group, a Gentile people group, the Romans. And so what Daniel is saying here is that this people group will produce a person who will be the Antichrist. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So it was Roman Gentiles who destroyed the holy city and the temple, and it will be the Roman, so the Antichrist will be a Gentile of 
Roman origin. Does that mean he'll come from the Italian peninsula? Does that mean, more specifically, that he will come from the Vatican, as some Protestants, rabid Protestants, would like to think? Not necessarily at all, because people of Roman origin have migrated all over the world. When I was growing up in Ties Hill, Beaumont Street, Hamilton, was known as Little Italy. Does that mean the Antichrist could come from Beaumont Street, Hamilton? Not likely. But to be honest, he could come from any continent or from just about any nation in the world because that's where people of Roman origin have migrated. From South America, North America, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, anywhere. His supernatural origin is hinted at in Genesis 3.15, where the Lord speaks to Satan and says, just after the fall, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is the first messianic prophecy in the Bible and is, it, as was observed, is del delivered to Satan. An offspring of the woman is coming to defeat him. The offspring of the woman is Christ, Messiah. The offspring of Satan is the Antichrist. When I was teaching Revelation and the content of my material was from uh, a Bible scholar, Arnold Frutenbaum, who is Jewish, he mentioned in his lectures Rosemary's Baby, and it is a book. And so I borrowed it from the Newcastle Library system and read it. It's a creepy book, and uh, it's not a feel-good book. It was later turned into a film starring Mia Farrow. But quickly, this book is about a couple, a married couple, and uh, her name is, the wife is Rosemary. And they live in New York City, and they're looking for a new apartment to rent. And they find a building with an apartment in it, which they love, and so they rent it. But Rosemary does not know that this uh, apartment building is full of Satanists. And in fact, her husband, unbeknown to her, is a Satanist himself. So he's probably in on all this. And this group of Satanists who occupy all these apartments in this building are looking for a female, a young female, who can be impregnated by a demon producing someone who's demonized from conception. Half demon, half human. A previous young lady that they thought would be the one jumped out of a window and committed suicide. That's not a nice book. And so Rosemary is chosen to be this person, and through a horrible event, she is impregnated and gives birth to a baby. So the baby, of course, is Rosemary's baby. So Arnold Frutenbaum draws the contrast. Mary's baby. Jesus, Rosemary's baby, the Antichrist. So could this be the, be the way it is? The Antichrist is demonized from conception. Not new, because in Genesis 6, we read that when the population of the world was small, demons, fallen angels, did impregnate human women, leading to a race called the Nephilim, and God dealt with that problem by destroying the whole world, wiping out God's, pro the devil's plan to pollute the whole of the human race, so that there would not be one virtuous woman left to give birth to the Christ, the Messiah. It would fit, this concept would fit 
totally in with his counterfeit role. Jesus' conception was energized by the Spirit of God so that he had no human male lineage. In Isaiah 7, 14, his lineage is given through the female line, his mother's line, whereas in every other part of the Bible, human lineage is traced through the male line. This is because Jesus had no human father. So the Antichrist is energized by Satan from his conception. And this would fit in with 2 Thessalonians 2.9, which says that the coming of the lawless one will be in accord with the activity of Satan. Other commentators like the late Tim LaHaye believe that the Antichrist will be born a normal human and then later Satan will come upon him and take total control of him. Whether it's one or the other, it doesn't matter because the outcome, outcomes will be the same. Let's look at the character of the Antichrist and then his activities. Daniel 8, 23 to 24 says that he will be a master of intrigue. He will most likely be heavily involved in the occult and come from that circle, from that scene. He will be very strong, but not by his own power. He is energized by Satan himself. Daniel 8.25 indicates that he will cause deceit to prosper. After all, his father, Satan, is the father of lies, as Jesus pointed out. There is no truth in him. Daniel 11.36 says that he will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will blaspheme like you wouldn't believe against God and against Jesus. This person, we can assume, will be a person of great charisma, handsome, of considerable physical presence. But if you looked into his eyes, you would see pure evil. He will become a world leader by intrigue, deception, and finally, by assassination and war. When he is a world leader of considerable standing, will there be a headline? The seed or offspring of Satan has arrived. Will there be a television announcement? The lawless one is here, or the beast has arrived. No. But Revelation 13 says that those who are wise, who have insight, will recognize him when he comes. And we'll look at this when we look at the mark of the beast next week. How old will he be when he begins to assert himself on the world stage? Well, Jesus began his public ministry at the age of 30. We could assume that the Antichrist, being a counterfeit of the real person, would be of a similar age. Is he alive now? Could he be a baby or a toddler or a child right now? We don't know because we don't know where we are in God's timetable exactly. Quite deliberately, God has not given us dates. Let's look at Daniel 9.27. You might like to look it up later. Daniel 9.27 says that he, and the context here is the Antichrist, we can't look at the whole chapter, he will confirm a covenant with many, he will confirm a covenant with many for, set, for one seven, and the context is years. He will confirm a covenant with many for a seven-year period. In the middle of the seven years, that means after three and a half years, 
he will put an end to sacrifice and offering in the temple. On a wing and on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. The context is Israel, the Antichrist, a person of great standing in the world, will sign a seven-year covenant with Israel, guaranteeing peace. Though Israel has a second-to-none defense force, it is always looking over its shoulder. And the time will come when it will be irresistible for the government and for the majority of the population of Israel to sign a covenant with this world figure who guarantees them peace. And this event will trigger God's wrath, known in the Bible as the day of the Lord or elsewhere, the time of Jacob's, Jacob's trouble, or simply the most common term, the tribulation or the great tribulation. We read in John, John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 11, these words. He, that is Jesus, the Messiah, came to his own, and his own received him not. Apart from a small minority, he was rejected by the nation, by the people that he came to, his chosen people. How would God how will God feel when Israel, his chosen people, sign a covenant with the Antichrist? Will this event, which is still future, will trigger God's wrath upon this whole world? A world which I learned just last week is a world in which in some place or some places, there are babies in the womb now who are marked, designated for sex trafficking. And 1 John 5, 19 says this, we know two things. We know that we are the children of God because we belong to Christ. And secondly, we know that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. And God is going to pour out his wrath, his judgments upon this world. At the end of this seven-year tribulation, remnant Israel will believe in Jesus as their Messiah and will be saved, as promised in Romans 11, 25 to 27. You can look it up later. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. This is written to Gentiles. We Gentiles must not get conceited when it comes to Israel. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. There's a prophecy, and God keeps his promises 100%. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, quoting from Isaiah and Jeremiah, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And some people, some Gentiles will say, I don't agree with this. I believe that the church has replaced Israel. Well, you are wrong. Because if God does not keep his promises to Israel, which necessitates a messianic kingdom, he can only fulfill his promises to Israel. So numerous in the Old Testament that they are in their hundreds. If he does not keep these promises to his chosen people, Israel, which necessitates a messianic kingdom, 
How can you be sure that God will keep his promises to you? How can you be sure that your sins are forgiven? How can you be sure that the promised the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of all that is to come, the resurrection and eternal life? At the midpoint of this seven-year period, the Antichrist will have achieved total dictatorship of the world by intrigue, assassinations, and war. The Antichrist will accept what Jesus rejected when Satan offered him all the kingdoms of the world if he would bow down and worship him. And again, if you look up Matthew chapter 4, 8 to 10 later, I'm going to read it now. Again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So he rejected Satan's offer. It was the Father's will that his son Jesus would rule over the kingdoms of the world, and he will. But it would be by way of the cross, not by bowing down to Satan. But energized by Satan himself, the Antichrist will accept from his father Satan the kingdoms of this world, but it will only be for three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days. And midway through this seven-year period, he will break his promise, his covenant with Israel, as prophesied in Daniel 9.27. And this event presupposes three things. One, Israel is an entity. Israel exists. And this was achieved, this happened in 1948. Two, biblical Jerusalem will be in Jewish hands. This was achieved in 1967. Three, there will be a functioning temple on the Temple Mount. This is still future. So the Antichrist will stop Jewish worship at the temple and do his own thing. The term abomination of desolation simply means the violation of the temple so that it becomes foul, abhorrent, and detestable, causing one to feel nauseous. The Antichrist will enter the most holy place and proclaim himself to be God, as it says in 2 Thessalonians 2.4. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Jesus warns the Jews in Matthew 24.15 and 16, who drop everything, and he says, drop everything when this event occurs and flee to the mountains, to the mountains east of Jerusalem, the mountains of Jordan, present-day Jordan, because God will provide a safe corridor, a corridor of safety for the Jews, and he won't allow the armies of the Antichrist to touch them. This corridor of safety will lead all the way through to Bosra, better known by its Greek name, Petra. So when you see Jesus said in this prophetic word, his Olivet, Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 15, 16, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel in Daniel 9, 27. Let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, because energized by Satan, 
the Antichrist will begin his program of the total annihilation of the Jews. In the second half of the tribulation, he will expend all his energy on this task. He will go after Jews and after those who give their allegiance to Christ, who refuse to take the Antichrist's mark of allegiance, the mark of the beast. The Antichrist will attempt to do what Haman failed to do in ancient Persia. He will attempt to, to do what Hitler failed to do in the 1930s and the 1940s. He will attempt to do what Iran vows to do, but will fail to do. What is the real reason for virulent anti-Semitism? throughout history, and it's on the rise today. A hatred so intense that it desires the annihilation of this particular people group. It's unique in the history of the world. The reason is so simple that can so easily be missed. Energizing this movement is Satan. For Satan knows better than we do that God's program is so integ integrally connected with his people, Israel, that if he, Satan, can destroy the Jews, he has derailed God's program and made his own position safe. Safe for eternity. The stakes are that high. And God will not let him get away with it. And so we come to the demise of the Antichrist, stated very succinctly in 2 Thessalonians 2.8. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Notice the language. He doesn't reveal himself. He will be, be revealed under God's sovereign plan. And God will make this counterfeit trinity Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, the counterfeit Holy Spirit, play out their roles to the nth degree. The lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Ed Hinson, who with Tim LaHaye put together the popular encyclopedia, of Bible prophecy, which is available at the at Kurong bookshops. I'll hold it up in a moment in the Q&A. He draws the following contrasts between Christ, the true Messiah, and the Antichrist, showing them to be mirror opposites. Christ, the truth. Antichrist, the lie. Christ, the holy one. Antichrist, the lawless one. Christ, the man of sorrows, temporarily in the Garden of Gethsemane. Antichrist, the man of sin. Christ, the son of God. Antichrist, the son of Satan. Christ, the mystery of godliness. Antichrist, the mystery of iniquity. Christ, the good shepherd. Antichrist, the worthless shepherd, Christ exalted on high, Antichrist cast down to hell, Christ humbled himself, the Antichrist exalted himself, Christ was despised, Antichrist will be admired, Christ cleanses the temple, Antichrist defiles the temple. Christ is slain for the people. The Antichrist slays the people. Christ is the lamb. The Antichrist is the beast. While there is time, if you haven't already, give your total allegiance to Christ, the true Messiah. While we are in this time of grace, for well, the time is coming 
when there will be a stark choice for this world, give your allegiance to Christ or give your allegiance to the Antichrist and take upon yourself his mark of allegiance. Those who take his mark of allegiance will have passed the point of no return. Thank you, Father, for sending your precious Son to us, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you that he is the Holy One, the one who became the man of sorrows for us, who for the joy that was before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Thank you that in him you have revealed the mystery of godliness, only dreamt about by the Old Testament prophets. Thank you that he is the good shepherd who gave his life for his sheep and who will take us safely home. We recognize his voice and we follow him. Thank you that he is now exalted on high at your right hand as our great high priest until that moment when you send him back for us. Thank you that he humbled himself casting aside all his rights and privileges, taking upon himself the form of a man, becoming a servant and submitting himself to the cross for us. Thank you that he was willing to be despised and rejected so that we might be cherished and accepted by you. Thank you that he cleanses us of everything that defiles. Amen.